Hello everyone, and for once I can say I'm not sitting, but I'm standing on the dock of the bay, all right? This is actually a dock of a Willapa River, and it is literally moving out into Willapa Bay. This seems to be, uh, you might say, a, an unlikely place where we would have a conversation or have the subject of agriculture and farming. But what happens on the banks of the Willapa River in Raymond, Washington is of very significant importance to agriculture. And I'm talking on a large, large scale. Located here is Creative Ag Products. They are producers of Pacific Grow. It is an oceanic hydrolysate, is what it's called typically. And it's oceanic because it is made from marine waste, you might say. Now we're talking salmon, crabs, shrimp that have basically been discarded from other companies where everything that they could not use. Pacific Grow takes in and turns it into something that is of amazing benefit to soil. It's a soil amendment, as it's first, and it's a, it's a liquid, a liquid soil amendment, and it is so effective, it's so beneficial in terms of what it does, what it restores to soil. Uh, Pacific Grow is referred to as seafood for the soil. So what we're going to do basically is uh, I want to introduce you to Jim Brackens of Creative Ag Products, maker of Pacific Grow. And we're going to talk, or he's going to tell us a bit about what it is, what it does. And I'll wager that you'll also start seeing how important it is to you and me for that matter today. Here goes. First of all, let's talk about what oceanic hydrolysate is, and then we'll get into it and, and it's how it's used and stuff like that. Okay, Adam. Um, when we talk about hydrolysate, we're actually talking about liquid fish fertilizer. Okay. And there are two kinds of liquid fish fertilizer. One is a hydrolysate, and which is called considered the cold process. All right. And one is emulsion, which is derived from a hot process. And uh, we chose years ago to concentrate on a cold process hydrolysate because when we started we didn't have enough money to heat it. And as we discovered through the years, it seems to be a superior product to the emulsion which is derived from the fish meal processing and it is cooked twice, and we consider it dead twice, mm -hmm. as far as microbiology. Okay. By not applying heat, uh, we have a very live microbiology population uh, in our product. So we're gonna talk about cold hydrolysate, mm -hmm. and our product brand name is Pacific Grow Oceanic, uh, and that's, called just oceanic that's one of ours we have oceanic with biochar mm -hmm. and we have oceanic with uh, crab and shrimp okay. so we do we do specialize in cold hydrolysated fish within agriculture is hydrolysate whether it's cold or hot known as a viable fertilizer for soil yes fish fertilizer has been used since the egyptian times and probably before that Okay. So historically, uh, fish, as most people remember when they went through school, the Indians planted fish under their corn. And crazy as it may seem, that's probably the most standard idea of what we do. The reason fish is such a good fertilizer is because most of our fish come out of the ocean. And the ocean is a com combination of everything that's on the earth. So as it goes into the seawater, uh, all different things, there's minerals, there's biology, there's fish, there's everything. 
And so we're able to get that from the fish that live in that. So as the fish go into the soil, they bring all kinds of nutrients to the soil. And, and of course, you're not putting uh, full uh, fish in like the Egyptians might have done. You're, you're kind of breaking them down, so to speak, okay? Yes, the fish, the minute they get out of the water, they start decomposing. And sometimes people smell that, okay? And it's a unique smell. However, what we do by getting them in a tank, grinding them and mixing them, we allow the natural enzymes to perform an enzymatic digestion of that fish. So in other words, instead of it laying on the fish bank and the sun and everything else goes on it and it sits there and decomposes over a period of time, we bring all the fish, the fish parts into our facility, grind them, and then allow them to do an enzymatic digestion in a tank. And so we have it controlled. The enzymatic digestion is meaning generally that the enzyme portion of the microbiology converts it from a solid to a liquid just in a period of time. And so what we do is we help them do that because we use grinders. So the enzymes don't have to spend a lot of time <clears throat> breaking it down. We use grinders and then we use choppers. And uh, as a result of that, we wind up with a liquid in a short period of time. And we uh, normally take 10 pounds of fish when hydraulic, when hydro, hydrolate, <laughs> hydrolyzated, <laughs> even I have a problem, when it's hydrolyzated, 10 pounds of fish equals one gallon of fish fertilizer. It's a little bit heavier than water, mm -hmm. and it depends on what we add to it, but basically it's about 8.6 pounds, 8.8 .8 pounds per gallon. So in essence then, uh, are there any special areas of great benefit, or this can be used for virtually any type of agriculture, from, a, from gardening to large-scale agriculture? Exactly right, and uh, the funny thing we found out about it, we've gone into six foreign countries and we've been into 26 states, and what we've discovered is that the fish hydrolyzate works almost perfectly in all types of soil, in all geographic areas of the soil. And by the way, this also is sprayed on as a foliar. It's not just a soil applied fertilizer. So the nice thing about being a liquid fertilizer, the hydrolyzate can be sprayed on uh, or ground applied or knifed in underneath the ground. So it's very versatile. We talk also about how depleted the various soils are. Now, it really, Depletion is one word, exhausted probably is another, especially since the uh, general agricultural practices do not replace what they've taken, <laughs> taken out, okay? In what way might a hydrolysate help to reverse this trend? Well, the funny thing about fish fertilizer, because of the population, the microbiology populations we have in that fertilizer, as we put it in the soil, it actually becomes a biological feed. So we are, generally speaking, feeding the biology that lives in the soil. It's always looking for something to eat, and so we take our fish loaded with biology, put it in the soil, and it does two things, or three, probably a hundred things. But the one thing it does is feed the microbiology in the soil. It becomes a food for them. And secondarily, those biologies, soil biologies, then start processing the soil at a much higher, more rapid rate than the normal rate. So as we give them feed in the form of fish fertilizer, then they start mining the minerals and all the different areas of the soil and they convert those so that they're plant available immediately. For instance, in the case of calcium, what we wind up with is a, a crab shell goes in the soil and it'll take anywhere from a year to three years to disintegrate and work into the soil and become a, a, a plant food. Kind of like time release there. Yeah, yeah. On our liquid, okay, we go in the soil, and we have a certain amount of calcium. Calcium. I got calcium out of my brain. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Okay. So let's. There show. is calcium in there. Okay. Well, we got calcium in ours, and then the microbes in the soil bring the calcium. And what happens is, rather than taking two or three years for the shell to disintegrate and become available, it's immediately available. I see. So I see. So it it's a very very uh, high and rapid development of calcium for a plant. You know, uh, I hear uh, that there are guidelines in place where uh, farms or farmers that want to convert from conventional to, for example, organic, they have to sit or allow the land to sit for like three years and there's this all this time. Uh, from what I'm hearing here is that with an application of hydrolysate, a sufficient amount of application, that really would not be necessary, would it? Well, it is necessary. That's a federal rule. Okay. To certify, be certified as an organic farm and organic soil, it, they force us to take a three-year conversion period. Mm -hmm. They assume that in that three years, then all the conventional fertilizers that have, you, you know, they've been in the soil for that will be depleted. And as they apply organic fertilizer at the beginning of the three-year period, then by the end, they've got that soil converted over to an organic uh, soil. Oh, okay. All so right that's then. not the three-year period is necessary. And the good news about fish is it speeds the process up of making the soil better. So. I see, I see. It's a huge, huge task still. There are millions upon millions of acres that represent conventional farming today. And so how do, you, how do you see this process of change happening? How does hydrolysate, what role can it play in that conversion? Well, another benefit of all the populations of microbiology in our product, most of the conventional farmers that have tried our product have found that the fish even help them because the fish makes, and the biology in the fish, makes the conventional fertilizer act faster and act better. So most often the conventional fertilizers using our product add to the soil. They're starting to rehabilitate the soil and they sometimes can uh, eliminate up to 25% of the conventional fertilizer going in the ground. So we do two things, we make their product work better and number two, we allow them to, to save enough money normally in, in the reducted cost of their conventional fertilizer input uh, to pay for the fish. So actually they're getting a better benefit from it. I guess the other, other benefit could be in plant productivity, uh, yields. Uh, how do you see what happens there? Generally speaking, most of our customers tell us <clears throat> that when they use our product, uh, as compared to their standard product that they use, have used for sometimes years, uh, would they see anywhere from a 10% to a 30% increase in productivity of their crops. Secondly, they find that maybe the crops ripen faster, which is really big for marketing. So that's the, the thing we hear most often. And crazy as it seems, we are an organic fertilizer company but probably 60% of our sales are to conventional farmers because they know what it's doing. Now, would it be correct to say that hydrolysate is actually helping to condition soils, improve and restore the more balanced condition to, the, to soils that may have been compacted, that may have been, I don't know, foul, <laughs> how you want to say it, but uh, uh, mineral deficient in that regard? Two or three things uh, that happen in the soil. A lot of the minerals and, and uh, nutrients that are in the soil naturally are combined and tied up so they don't release into the plant without a lot of extra effort. By adding our product and feeding the normal soil bacteria and biology, then they speed the process up. So the answer, I think, to your question is yes, we provide uh, energy to help convert the soil back to its original condition uh, before all the nitrates and the phosphates and, 
and glycificates, glycicates, and glycification. So, glycification, <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about the. You have one that has biochar in it. Let's talk about the decision to do it and what you've seen. Well, first of all, we have been very proactive in trying to get some nutrients that we don't provide in just the fish uh, that we've discovered are compatible with our product and therefore we're always looking for something we can blend into our fish that makes it a better product. Uh, there was a movement starting 10-12 years ago on, on uh, the biochar and we took a look at it and we tried it and we discussed we didn't know too much about it. However, we decided that we would like to try that and our unique processing it allows us to put some solids into our product and they suspend and don't drop out and they also don't plug sprinklers and that sort of thing because we make them so small the particles uh, flow. So we started with uh, biochar and we're into our third year in it now and we are getting reorders and the biochar is the perfect hotel for microbes and because of the electrical conductance of it, uh, it allows us to load the biochar. But you gotta understand what biochar is. Biochar is a real high grade charcoal and it's honey comb in structure. So there are a whole lot of spaces inside that little piece of biochar that allows microbes to live and it allows minerals to attach because it has a different electrical charge. And guess what? It's sitting there as a reservoir. And, and, and by the way, water also stores in it. Sitting there as a reservoir. So as a plant needs nutrients, the plant sends out a request through the soil asking for a nutrient. And with the biochar, it's immediately available if that's what we have in loaded in the biochar, it's immediately available to the plant. So the, the plant root system doesn't have to go out searching for it and work over super hard. It's sitting right there stored waiting for the plant to ask for it. Well, actually that conserved energy from having not having to do that search often translates into actually faster growth and more growth as well as higher, higher nutrient density. We haven't talked about that. Uh, talk a little bit about the nutrient value in the finished product. Well, the good news with our product, because we're making soil healthy, we have healthy plants, and healthy plants give healthy fruit and vegetables, and that means we have healthy people. And I started 17 years ago when uh, the organic program was kind of in its infant stages and two or three things happened. In those years, to, be, be, to begin with, farmers were very reluctant to convert to organics because they knew, at least in their brain, that the organic program costs more money, the fertilizer is more money. The second thing is they have less production, so less crops, so they're gonna lose two different directions. So why would they ever make a better product? So now we're talking 17 years later, uh, Joe the customer and Helen the customer, they want to be more healthy than they have been. So they have demanded organic fruit and vegetables and, and food products. We're talking to consumers. Are the doing consumers it. Yes. have been driving the maturity of the organic program. Now, the organic program's good, but it doesn't mean it's perfect. And so trying to make it good and perfect, they're starting to concentrate on nutrient density. So what they're trying to get is a strawberry that has less water in it and more nutrients, more uh, vitamins and, and more minerals and that sort of thing. And so when they do that, the crop is better, the people's health is better. And so we're trying to generate healthy soils to give healthy plants so we have healthy people. Okay, now relative to cost, you talked about in the beginning, <laughs> organic uh, and these types of amendments cost more and produce less. Has that metric changed? 
that metric has changed, and I'll give you an example. Some years ago, we had a growth trial at the University of Arizona at the Agricultural Center in Yuma, Arizona. And we went down and we took our product down, and we wanted to compare it to conventional grown lettuce. So the university planted one section of conventional lettuce, how they fertilize it, and they planted another section where they used our product. Um, our product produced the identical head of lettuce. I mean, it was within a half an ounce of the other head that looked good. And what we discovered upon the cost analysis was we used, first of all, nutrition-wise, one-fiftieth of the fertilizer nutrients that the conventional guys did, okay? And so at, at our cost level, we wound up being more cost effective uh, by about $30 an acre as compared to the conventional. And so we were the same price or lower, we're $30 an acre lower, and that we didn't even take in consideration. We grew an organic head of lettuce and our head of lettuce cost would bring more money at the store and was better healthy wise. Where are your distribution? Well, right now we like I mentioned before, we've been in six foreign countries. We're in twenty six states. Uh, we're actually situated on uh, twenty miles from the Pacific Ocean in the state of Washington, close to Seattle, and we're delivering into Florida, uh, Ala, uh, Alabama. Uh, we've been in the mid states. Uh, we've been all up and down the West Coast, so um, we are going to be a national uh, product uh, that will have delivery points, uh, central part of the United States and the southeast part of the United States, all delivered based on our fertilizer, which comes from basically salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Now, uh, before we go, there are three situations that come to mind uh, that I'd like to just give see what comes up for you there are certain challenges that farmers are coming up with and there are certain trends challenges have to do one that comes up to mind is high salinity uh, soils you have any thoughts any experiences or along those lines we've had uh, experiments in Mexico uh, one farmer uh, had a very high salinity type soil and about I don't know, six weeks into his growth he found out his plants were uh, stunted because of it, and they applied uh, one liter of our product per one hectare, which is two acres. And uh, they had a significant potato, it was a potato plant, they had a significant crop, and the potatoes came out all uniform size. They didn't have any culls, they didn't have big ones, they didn't have little ones, they had all one size. And they had uh, equal to or better than the conventional crop on the perfect soil. And we have an avocado orchard in the San Diego area that has a high salinity brackish water. And uh, as they applied our product, their trees actually bloomed, I mean, unbelievably, and they had about a 20% increase. So for some reason, our biology and ours thrives in salinity type soils. And so we're happy about that. Uh, uh, it seems to make sense uh, because you're, in your biology you also have a, a, a wider spectrum uh, of minerals. You have the enzymes, the enzymatic action. You've got the life that actually works the biology, so it, it kind of makes sense. Okay, so the second one has to do with typically in the southwest, but it's also, no, in the southeast, in the south and the southwest. It's called citrus, green, citrus greening condition with a psyllid. Any thoughts or experience there? Well, we've had several uh, experiments going on. We've had uh, citrus orchards in Southern California, uh, specifically lemons and limes. And I don't know if that, that disease is prevalent in those uh, species as oranges, but uh, the one system in, that we're dealing with in Florida, in that area, uh, they have seen significant improvement in their crops and less greening uh, than with their conventional systems. So we're happy, we're, we're working on that uh, right now and we think we've got a companion product that uh, if added to ours, we can really have a significant uh, help on citrus greening. Okay. 
And the other thing is a trend, and that trend uh, has to do with the ascendancy of hemp as a crop, maybe as a cash crop, uh, but uh, it seems that uh, as far as hydrolysate is concerned, it doesn't seem to matter what it is, but talk a little bit about that for a prospective hemp grower or cannabis grower. Well, uh, what we've discovered in cannabis and right now in hemp in our grows, the people that are buying and using it, is we make that stuff grow like a weed, okay? <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> okay. uh, we have had significant uh, plant improvement in, in thickness of, of the plant structure and better blooms. We have a lot of crystals on the blooms uh, in the THC market. In the CBD market, we have had uh, tremendous opportunities in very large grows uh, to to find out that the fish hydrolate is an extremely good fertilizer and feed for soil microbes in that crop. So we think, uh, based on our experience so far in cannabis, uh, that we will be a major player in the hemp fertilization program. All right, uh, Jim, I know you've got a lot to do, but we're going to be bringing you from time to time. We're going to talk more about, about hydrolysate, about uh, the applications, and also be bringing to people some developments it's from time to time as, as it goes. But uh, it, our vision is to uh, get hydrolysate from the plant here <laughs> into plants. <laughs> well, we, uh, we started 17 years ago, and... Uh, we uh, processed over 10 million pounds of fish this past year, which made a million gallons of hydrolysate. And our goal is to move that this year and uh, do the same thing or more next year. So we appreciate the public and we appreciate the people who have become our clients. And uh, thank you, Adams. For that's all right. Uh, the, the website is Pacific Grow without the W. That's right. Dot com. Pacific Grow. Thank you, Thanks. Jim. Oh, enjoy the sounds. Enjoy the vision as the tide rolls in here on Willapa Bay. I'm in the town of Toklan. Well, I don't know if I want to call it a town. It's certainly a community. <laughs> Population of 151, okay? That's kind of cool, isn't it? At any rate, I hope you enjoyed and found the information about hydrolysate and Pacific Grow useful, a benefit. This is something that is of far, far greater importance to society than we recognize, I'll just say, in many ways, we don't recognize just how doable the changes that we are all seem to be asking for, how doable those changes are, how possible, how accessible they are. Hydrolysate is not a product that is a dream. It's not something that is, uh, you know, something down the road that we wish we could make happen. It's a product that's available right now for virtually any type and size of farm, of growing operation. The elements that are normal and customary uh, to be included uh, that, it, that are in this particular product are something that soils need in order to produce and provide essential nutrients to go into plants. That when so provided and consumed by animals as well as people are actually beneficial to their health are 
beneficial to balance. That's what this stuff is. That's what it does. And the supply is out there. We're not in short supply. It's not scarce. The only limitation is our awareness. And the only real block are our present habits that we are comfortable doing because they aren't or have not up, and up so far been so clearly shown to be self-destructive that we haven't been moved to change them. I, I really think that pattern is changing. It's real evident to me and I didn't grow up on a farm. I didn't grow up caring about what happens on a farm or how farming is done, what goes into the crops. And when I first started hearing about and then seeing what they did, it seemed odd, but you know, who was I to question it? I didn't know. But man, I have been continuing to learn and continuing to understand and getting deeper appreciation of what are the consequences of standard procedures, standard agricultural procedures, standard gardening procedures. You know, our thinking and our habits are what need to change. Otherwise, we keep doing what we're familiar with. We don't associate an adverse reaction to the behavior. And I'm just taking one. It's not the only habit we have. We have many. And you got to start, you got to start breaking them down one by one. You got to analyze them one by one and be willing to find and seek other solutions once you realize what's causing the problem. And our problems are metabolic. Our problems are environmental, and guess what? Metabolic problems and environmental problems are the same thing. They have the same causes. And those causes are imbalances due to misapplication, inappropriate application of substances that we thought and been told were actually the things to do. But if you found the information on hydrolysate and introducing Jim Brackens and his specific grow product of value, you can visit the site at Pacific Grow without the W.com. And also let it be known that we're now offering Pacific Grow products at presidentwater.com. All right. Anyone that comes to presidentwater.com looking to do something to enhance their water, to get more value, to get more benefit from their water supply, or to reduce and mitigate some of the ill effects of how of the state that their water is in once they are ready to use it. Vortex generators are a key and as it turns out any soil input that you use especially ones that are beneficial it's going to actually help you get even more benefit from it even to the point that you very likely can use and would want to use and be able to use less of it, less of the soil input, even less of the water, and still get far, far more benefit and value, get much greater crops, yields, much higher nutrient value, especially when you're putting 
the elements that create the nutrient, that make the nutrients available back into your soils. It's not rocket science, as it turns out. It's actually real science. It's crop science, it's life science. That's what this is. This is the science of life. Okay, with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. Till next time, peace. Be well and I love you all.